Section 3.3, cell membrane. So what is a cell membrane and what is its role for the cell? Well, first of all, it's a barrier that separates the cell from its external environment or it separates the inside of the cell, the internal environment, from the outside of the cell, the external environment. It also plays a role in, in passage of materials into and out of the cell. It allows certain materials to pass allows others not to pass. So what makes up the cell membrane? Well first it's a double layer of phospholipid molecules. Okay, so this is called a lipid bilayer or a phospholipid bilayer. And it's interspersed with other other molecules, a bunch of other stuff. So as you can see there's cholesterol in here. Okay, there's, there's carbohydrates, these side sugar chains, um, as well as some of these membrane proteins that will go either through or embedded in the surface of either the inside or outside of the cell membrane. So it's composed of a bunch of different stuff. So what are the three parts of a phospholipid molecule? Well, it's composed of a charged phosphate group. As you can see in the diagram, this would be the charged phosphate group here a glycerol molecule, which would be this part here, and these two fatty acid chains, which would be here. And if we have to draw and label this, say for a quiz or a test, you would just put the phosphate group looking like this. And so we go charge phosphate, charge phosphate, because this thing is actually going to be polar. This will be charge, so it's going to make the one end of the polar part of it. Okay, there's a glycerol. Glycerol. And then two fatty acid chains. Okay, so this, this end of charge phosphate, this is polar. The fatty acid chains are nonpolar. That's that's a very important um, aspect to how it functions as a barrier or water barrier around the cell. What parts make up the head and are those parts polar or nonpolar? Well the head is made up of a charged phosphate group, this part right here, and glycerol. The phosphate's charged so the head part, this ball on top, would be polar. What parts make up the tail, and are these polar or nonpolar? Well, the tail portion, this part of the phospholipid molecule, are two fatty acid tails. Since they're fats, since they're lipids, they are nonpolar. So the tails would be nonpolar. How are the phospholipid molecules arranged in the cell membrane and why is this arrangement necessary? Well first it is a double layer. Okay, so the polar head group, polar heads are facing both outside, so this is outside of the cell, and inside of the cell. Try it in blue, see that better. Okay, and <clears throat> The tails are facing each other, so the tails are making up this portion, like in the middle part of the of the lipid bilayer. The reason it does this is so there's a polar charge in the outside and inside of the cell, which will help with transport of materials across the cell membrane or through the cell membrane. And this middle portion of the cell membrane being nonpolar it also helps with transport of materials across the cell membrane or being able to select which materials are crossing the cell membrane what molecules are embedded in the cell membrane and what is the role of each the first of these is cholesterol cholesterol is embedded in the lipid bilayer all these guys are cholesterol molecules and what they do is they provide strength or rigidity to the cell membrane, but are still allowing it to be flexible. Other molecules would be specific proteins that help materials cross the cell membrane. 
Um, these proteins could be um, transport proteins, um, channel proteins, pores, uh, carrier proteins, or cell membrane pumps. All that would be located going all the way through or on the surface of the cell membrane and parts of the cytoskeleton as well. And carbohydrates, some of these carbohydrates act as like ID tags. These carbohydrates sticking up where uh, they will make the cells recognizable to other cells from the same organism so they know they're, they're some of the good guys and not something foreign that has entered, entered the organism. Why is the cell membrane referred to as a fluid mosaic model? And explain well first fluid because it's flexible kind of flowing like our river here it flows and mosaic because it's a bunch of different things stuck together to make up the entire surface or the entire structure of the cell membrane okay um, imagine if, if these little tiles here were all the phospholipid you know phosphate heads on one side of the cell membrane all these are sticking together to form this entire structure called the cell membrane. We would have other things like the membranes, uh, the, the, the membrane proteins that would be embedded in it, and you know the cholesterol embedded in it, but all this stuff kind of sticks together, a bunch of different parts stick together that make up the big picture of the membrane, which is a fluid mosaic model. So it's fluid, meaning it moves, and it's made of a bunch of stuff stuck together tightly. Fluid mosaic model. What does it mean to be selectively permeable? Well, if it were fully permeable, anything could come into the cell or out of the cell. That just doesn't happen. So it must be semi-permeable or selectively permeable to get stuff to come in. What stuff? Well, the stuff that would be needed for the cell. Um, nutrients, ions, um, water, sugar, Different, different things that are necessary for the cell to live, if it was to survive. If it was impermeable, where nothing could come in, that would be a problem too, because how would the cell get food in or nutrients in, and how would it get waste out? So it needs to be selectively or semi-permeable to allow the cell to function the best way it possibly can, which would be getting the stuff in that it needs, getting rid of the waste that it doesn't need, and selectively permeable cell membrane membrane allows it to do that. The other term that's used in place of selectively permeable would be semi-permeable. Semi meaning like half or some stuff can get in, some stuff can't get in, some stuff can get out, some stuff can't get out. So that would be semi-permeable. It allows certain materials to pass through the cell mem membrane with relative ease and others to not come in at all. Why is selective permeability important for a cell? The main thing is it enables the cell to maintain homeostasis, that steady internal state that it requires. Um, it's going to it's going to want to keep the substances within its cell relatively balanced. So if it's using some stuff up, it's going to need to get those materials replaced. If it's producing waste, it's going to want to get rid of those materials that are waste products. <clears throat> so they would need to get shipped out of the cell, while the nutrients necessary for the cell would need to get moved into it. What kinds of molecules can easily pass through the cell membrane? Well, the first thing would be small and nonpolar. And the reason I would say small and nonpolar is because if this was outside of the cell, these small nonpolar molecules would be able to slip through right between the phospholipid, mo phospholipid molecules and enter the side of the plasma of the cell. If they were charged, they would probably get either stuck to the polar head on the outside of the cell if they were opposite charges. And if they're the same charges, they would be repelled so they would get bounced off. <clears throat> If they were polar, they'd be repelled by the nonpolar fatty acid tails in the middle. So if they're nonpolar, they'd want to hang out with them. And since they're small, they fit right through. Eventually, as you can see, this is time going this way. More and more substances will be able to pass through the cell membrane. So you can see early on, very little transport. Here, we're getting a lot more 
particles that were able to pass through the cell membrane until it gets to a point of actual equilibrium where the amounts on inside and outside the cell are the same. So how do other molecules get through or across the cell membrane? Well, if they were relatively small and polar molecules, they can enter through these transport proteins or cell membrane proteins where the charge would be okay for it to pass through this pore through the cell membrane. Notice this goes all the way through the lipid bilayer outside and inside the cell. And so this channel or pore membrane protein allows small polar molecules to pass through. Um, large molecules are going to need some help. Okay. And what they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to form vesicles. This is a, a process called here. It's showing exocytosis where something, something inside the cell here gets wrapped up in this membrane fuses with the cell membrane here and then dumps the contents outside of the cell. Um, so if it's a large molecule and needed to get out of the cell, it would use this process called exocytosis. Uh, the same thing can happen reverse, where if you want to get large particles from the outside in, they can form vesicles from the cell membrane and get brought into the cell where they can be used. And that would be a process of endocytosis. What is a receptor? Okay, a receptor is a part of cellular communication. And what it is is usually a, a membrane protein that sticks up from the surface. And it will detect a signal molecule and perform an action in response. Um, think of it like if this was, you're, you're trying to go through your house, right? This is the door of your house, right? And you ring the doorbell and you get this action inside okay in my house the doorbell rings and my dogs go crazy inside because they're hearing this this signal that's coming from the outside of the house but it sets off the reaction inside the house um, same way this chemical whatever is this this molecule will fit into this receptor protein and it will trigger response inside the cell and something will happen or some metabolic reaction some cellular response uh, some process will take place in response to the signal being received from outside the cell. Why does it recognize and bind to only certain molecules? The molecule, the signal molecule, and the receptor have complementary shapes, meaning the signal molecule is going to have to fit perfectly into the binding site on the receptor protein. So the right cell will get the right signal. This is called a ligand when this thing hit fits in there. Okay, so the correct shape, charge, size, molecule will fit into the receptor protein and it will sell it will trigger this response inside the cell. What is a ligand? A ligand is the signal or molecule that binds to the receptor. Like in the last slide, this would be the signal molecule or the ligand that is going to fit into this site on the receptor protein. What happens when a receptor and ligand bind and why is this important? The first thing that happens is when this ligand fits into this receptor, is the receptor protein changes shape. Okay, this affects how the receptor interacts with other molecules. The shape change triggers a reaction in the cell or in the membrane because it's, it's making itself bigger, smaller, something. It's changing shape to produce a response in response to the ligand binding with the receptor protein. What are the two types of receptors? The two types are intracellular receptors and membrane receptors. Intracellular receptors would be receptors that are inside of the cell. Notice this is inside of the cell. So the signal molecule would, able, would be small enough and be able to pass through the cell membrane and bind with the receptor protein inside the cell. Once it does that, whatever it does to um, 
trigger response or trigger reaction in the cell would happen. Okay, um, a membrane receptor would be for molecules that would be too big to pass through the cell membrane. So the receptor protein, membrane receptor, would be this thing where it's, it's fitting in the cell membrane all the way through it. The receptor protein would hit here. This guy would change shape and set off a response inside the cell. So the signal molecule never goes inside the cell. It just hits the receptor protein, the membrane receptor, and triggers a response inside the cell. What is an intracellular receptor and where are they found and why? Well, like I said last time, the receptor is inside the cell, inside the cell, found in the cytoplasm. And so the ligand, the signal molecule, can actually cross the cell membrane and get into the cell. Okay, or in this case, you can see these, these guys would be able to go through and bond to the receptor inside the cytoplasm of the cell. What is a membrane receptor? Where are they found and why? Well, membrane receptors are found in the cell membrane, literally embedded between the layers of the lipid bilayer. Uh, these are used for ligands or signal molecules that are too big or charged or otherwise would not be able to pass through the cell membrane. So what they do is they trigger changes as to what is allowed in or out of the cell. The ligand will, ligand will bind and will set up a response inside the cell to trigger a response.